Aging will never be the same for every individual. Our aging populations across the world have unique healthcare needs, which are both global and local in nature. How can we predict and identify risks early, tailor care towards different patients, and how can data and technologies help? In the next session, Prevention, Prediction, Personalization, Scott Berkowitz, VP and Chief Population Health Officer, Johns Hopkins Medicine, Associate Professor of Cardiology, Johns Hopkins University, and Henry Bradotti, Professor of Aging and Mental Health and Co-Director, Center for Healthy Brain Aging at the University of New South Wales, Sydney, offer their perspectives. Well, hi, Scott. Nice to meet you. It's very nice to meet you as well, Henry. Yeah. So we come from different ends of the, uh, the spectrum, really. Um, you're, you're coming from cardiology and population health. I'm a clinician, I'm a psychogeriatrician, and I work uh, with people with dementia. I do a lot of diagnoses and work in, uh, see people in nursing homes, and I go to people's homes as well. Uh, and I've been doing a lot of research in this area for well, many years. <laughs> Great. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a, a cardiologist, a general cardiologist, and also the chief population health officer for Johns Hopkins Medicine. And so in that capacity, I, I'm involved in helping to set uh, the population health activities and agenda uh, within our organization, working on trying to improve care for populations uh, within our various communities and being able to assess and understand the impact of that work. Uh, I'm a part of a new in office which is uh, being developed, and the work that we're doing right now spans a whole set of priority areas, which I would be happy to explore in more depth. But the, uh, the big picture is that we do a lot of work to focus on improving the health for aging populations and, and those with greatest needs, typically those with multiple comorbidities and chronic conditions. Uh, and trying to think about opportunities for personalizing care and and being able to prevent and support the care of those patients. Uh, thanks. I've been around for about 40 years doing this sort of work and moved into it clinically subsequently and then started doing research and took up a chair in uh, aged care and mental health, uh, aging and mental health, and uh, have been doing that now for about 30 years. Um, I work quite a lot as, in advocacy and in policy as well, and I'm very interested in population health. Uh, so sort of spanning from the, the macro level right down to the, uh, the person level. So as far as the macro level, um, we know there's close on uh, half a billion people in the world right now with dementia. The estimates are in the high 400s, millions that is. And uh, that's set to, to triple in, within about 30 or 40 years. Uh, numbers vary and a lot of extrapolations in, in making those estimates. I mean, in the last century, we added 25 years and 100 years to life expectancy. It was just an amazing statistic. We have about 16% of the population aged over 65. The, the fastest growing sectors are those over 80, or particularly the, the, the older the sector, the, the faster the growth. So the, the 100 year olds, the centenarians, we have about 6,000 in Australia. We, we're going to have more than triple that by about 2050, it's rapidly growing. So th there's a lot of areas for, um, in, in, for work there. So in my work, I've been particularly interested in uh, several areas in prediction, in, sorry, in prevention. And we're running a large trial, which we can come back to, which is online using lifestyle factors. And in better diagnosis and care and most of the research happens at the high-tech area, but most of the action happens at the primary care level. And uh, there's a big disconnect there. And then uh, finally, uh, trying to improve care, both in hospitals and in residential care and in community care. And I, I know you're particularly interested in that. One of the issues is, uh, can we get better integration of community care to prevent residential care? So in our country, we have about 190,000 people in residential care um, and about 160,000 receiving some sort of home care packages. That's, that's terrific background. You know, I think that um, a, a common theme in, uh, from both of our experiences is the idea of trying to be able to provide that right care, right place, right time for the patient. And to the extent that that care can be provided in a 
uh, and appropriately provided in a lower cost setting, it's advisable to be able to do that. And to your point, if it can be provided in the home, it's better than in a facility. If it can be provided in a facility, it's better than in a hospital. Um, and we continue to try to work on trying to uh, allow that patient to get to that right care setting and to be supported by family and other team members in doing so. We also are, um, think that there's opportunities in prevention, but also as you get into uh, more into personalization and, uh, and prediction, uh, particularly with patients of, uh, of more significant needs and multiple comorbidities, whether it's mental health or, or other, uh, other uh, chronic conditions, we try to do work to be able to identify those patients and, and to be able to understand how to best tailor our programs for their needs, uh, a very personalized uh, approach to care. I think data and analytics is really key in being able to do that and to be able to use that data in the right way and to be able to use risk prediction tools. And we're fortunate to have some folks on our team who have uh, that, that type of expertise. And the uh, ACG model of care actually was developed at the School of Public Health at, at Hopkins. So we're fortunate in being able to collaborate with folks there who have been developing risk models for, for some period of time. But, but, but I do think it's, if you can personalize the care, if you can understand the needs of those patients, if you can be able to provide services and you're able to deliver those services in a lower cost setting or in their homes, so they're able to be around their families for longer and with that support mm -hmm. from caregivers, it really is a wonderful thing that you've uh, been able to show and achieve. And uh, I think that's, um, that's really terrific. Um, we, we also are still trying to think about opportunities in that way. There's a program that we have, which um, is called PACE. It's called the Program All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly, which is a combined in the US Medicare and Medicaid duals program. Uh, it's a separate financing model where it's similar home-based model with services. You go to a daycare type facility and you receive services and you have wrapped around all sorts of services, geriatrics and other services. It tends to be limited in states. Um, our state is looking currently at trying to expand that, but it's been very successful, uh, again, with the focus on services and really being able to tailor it for the needs of a typically high risk and high cost population. And with that, you're able to provide more services that they need. So I think it's really terrific. It sounds like there's parallels uh, between our countries and some of the work, but it's, it's just really awesome. And um, I like the personalized approach, uh, Scott. Um, I've um, been advocating for a few years now that we can learn from what medicine's done, for example, pharmacogenomics and breast cancer, where we have very tailored treatments based on genetic profiles, as well as the nature of the pathology and so forth. And there's no reason we can't do the same with psychosocial interventions or community interventions uh, where we can tailor it to what the person needs and not provide a one-fits-all uh, model. And uh, I, I think we can learn from medicine and, and import that, that um, model. And with, I mean, I've been focusing on dementia, but dementia is just one of many aging morbidities and that occur. And it's, it's pretty narrow not to think about the whole person and think about the, the social sphere they're in, the, the relationships they have, the physical morbidity as well as the cognitive morbidity and psychological morbidity. So it really, you need to draw a map of what's happening with that person. And when I'm teaching, I talk about drawing an etiological map and then saying, you've got factors in all these different domains now work out what your priorities and how that would work together and then tailor a package. So uh, I think we're very uh, much on the same pathway there. Yeah, yeah I, I love that idea. And we also have described, you know, thinking about that maybe 30% of the care is, might be related to typical clinical factors and there's other behavioral, emotional factors. Mm -hmm. And then we also have other social factors, which we call social determinants of health. Um, and in our delivery system, which spans many urban cities with disadvantaged communities, as well as uh, more upscale communities in different areas. You have all comers with all different needs and challenges. And we have patients who are not able to get the transportation they need, those who uh, are not able to get food or to pay for their medications or things of that sort. And so similar, as you think about the whole person, I think you're exactly right. We need to be, think about their sort of 
chronic types of conditions, as well as maybe their mental health, behavioral health, substance abuse challenges, as well as other population-based needs that our teams may have related to accessing medications, accessing care, being able to get what they need, housing instability. And so I think you're exactly right, as you really understand that whole person. And there's different care team members, like I'm sure it is for you, who are able to best meet those needs. We have sort of the more typical um, clinician component. Uh, we also have many terrific team members in nursing support roles, case managers. We have licensed clinical social workers related to behavioral health. We have our community health workers who come from the neighborhoods that they help to support patients with needs. And we call completing barriers to care assessments. How can they help patients navigating those particular environments? Um, and so it really does take a village uh, in order to, to, to be successful in managing the care of populations of patients. And I think it is absolutely essential to personalize the care for these patients and understand what their particular needs are and, and to be able to then best ensure that you meet them and then can understand over time the impact of that work. Yeah, one of the areas that we've been working on currently is in, um, in post-diagnostic care. And uh, we've got a fair bit of it, a lot of evidence to show that when people get the diagnosis, they're often left in a void. That they're confused, uh, they're befuddled, they don't know what's coming next. And uh, there's so much that we can offer apart from the prescription of a cholinesterase inhibitor if they have Alzheimer's disease. And so, um, you know, there's rehabilitation, there's cognitive training. There's uh, cognitive stimulation therapy, there's working with the family, there's psychological therapies, there's integrating them into active pursuits. Uh, but particularly in, in primary care, and even amongst my specialist colleagues, uh, people are fairly nihilistic about what can be done to help people. And so th this is an area that uh, I think uh, we'll see more and more developments into. It seems to me the drugs are coming that may have an effect on Alzheimer's, not other dementias. And um, vascular dementia is the second most common dementia. And we know that all the vascular risk factors are also risk factors for dementia as well. And one of the strategies that we've been trying to promote is for our hypertension specialists, our diabetes specialists, our cardiac specialists, to always think about the brain as well as <laughs> that particular organ that they're involved in it and vice versa of course brain specialists. it's not just it's about not just the about the heart <laughs> that's right yeah yeah and uh it's very hard to get people to change their behavior as, as we all know um but we know that if we can get people exercising more and if we could get people eating a healthier diet and avoiding obesity and uh, hypercholesterolemia and, and and diabetes uh then they would have a lower rate of dementia and the estimates are that about 40% of the population attributable risk is with environmental factors that we can modify. And yeah. that's what led us to do a, um, an online trial and we've been, uh, we just finished it last month actually, haven't got the data analyzed yet, but uh, there were 6,000 people randomized and did this study and uh, looking at uh, nutrition, uh, exercise, brain training. There's a lot of computer cognitive training programs out there, some with better evidence than others, and uh, also treatment with depression, anxiety, and everything was done online. Everything's measured online, delivered online. So eminently scalable at a population level if we can show benefit for that. So that's the hope. That sounds wonderful. I look forward to learning about the results of your, your study. Yeah, me, me too. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I will tell you, though, as a practicing cardiologist, I, you know, I not infrequently have the conversation with patients about the fact that, you know, cardiovascular disease is a systemic disease. It is a disease of all organs and vessels and inflammation. And the way in which you have to manage that is the way you have to manage it universally across your body with, as you suggested, with dietary reduction changes, um, exercise medications at times and things of that sort, but, but really focusing on the, the whole body and, and the way in which um, all of those elements of atherosclerotic vascular disease manifest uh, across one's body. So I, I, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate your comments about um, 
the manifestations in terms of dementia. Um, I do think that it's, you know, we focus on, on several of these areas and, and need to try to be focused on risk prediction and modification and reduction and, uh, and really changing behavior. Uh, you know, this is again, another one of those intersections that we have within our world uh, is that if this really requires risk factor modification, but behavior modification as well and changing the way we approach building in the time for exercise and things of that sort um, and making sure that people in different communities, some are able to access exercise equipment, some are not trying to meet people where they are in terms of figuring out how they can get access to those sorts of foods. Some people may be in food deserts, but they don't have as, access, as much access to nutritious foods. And, and so I think being sensitive to those issues and how we can help patients, families, and communities with um, accessing what they need for a healthy life uh, is important. And there's so many ways to try to help to support that, but it can be challenging in certain environments for sure. Yeah, that, that's true. But it, it, it goes even wider than that. I, I was reading recently about um, the link between air pollution mm. and nature and the you know, amount of particulate, particulate matter in the air uh, has been associated uh, with higher rates and excellent work out of the US where they're able to have parcel out the whole country into small pockets and find air pollution um, gradients across those and then look at gradients of incidence of uh, various diseases. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, and even just socialization, people who socialize more uh, seem to have better health. It, you know, we don't know which way the direction of causality goes, but even with long follow-up, people who uh, socialize more have less dementia and less other health problems. And so we, we're trying to think about ways to improve that I think there will be advances in each area of prevention, prediction, and personalization in the next 10 years. I think that the opportunity related to personalization is really impressive because I think that technology, genomics, data and analytics, the ability to look at it in different ways, we will increasingly be able to understand people and their needs at, at, a, at a whole deeper level than we're able to do so today, to be able to best tailor therapies and other treatments for patients, and, and to be able to then deliver them, and to be able to understand the impact of them. There's something that we have that's actually called personal personalized medicine, um, precision medicine, and, and sort of it gets at that idea of really being able to get layers deeper in terms of understanding the genomics and other elements. That's a, a big set of programs that are featured at, at Hopkins. And there's a lot of work that's happening in, but even in, in the space with respect to population health and precision population health, our opportunity to really understand each individual and in their, in their needs, I think will continue to improve uh, over, the coming, over the coming years. It's an exciting, it's a very exciting field of growth uh, and, and opportunity, I think, for science and medicine in general. Well, I, I agree with, with Scott. There'll be advances in all of them. I'm worried that we're overselling the prevention side with dementia. Uh, the results have been positive. Uh, mainly they're epidemiological rather than intervention trials. And the intervention trials, the results, the effect sizes have not been great. I mean, I'm hopeful that we'll do better. As far as predictions concerned, the growth in biomarkers and imaging uh, continues to grow. So on the technical side of things, uh, we're doing really well there. Uh, as far as the personalization, I think that's a big opportunity that's, that's waiting to be taken. And uh, when, you know, everybody now has huge databases and the world is changing. We're now sharing data like never before. And it's easier. And we can now interrogate huge databases across multiple countries. And so we've just been working on a, a blueprint for dementia research for WHO. Uh, our group has been involved in that. And you realize that what we're doing in the United States or Australia may not be appropriate, often isn't for India or a, a, a low income country. And so we do have to take a, a global view of this as, as well. Well, well, Henry, this is just this has been uh, so much fun uh, to learn more about your work and, and what you're doing uh, with your colleagues in Australia. 
and I hope that we'll have the opportunity to continue this conversation in the future. Uh, uh, thanks, Scott.